Um, good afternoon. Oh. How are you guys? <laughs> um, I don't know why the class strength is kind of going down, right? Um, but I guess I suppose uh, it's nice excellent, outside. nice outside. Yeah. Um, that's that's one of the things with, with conferences, right? When you go to a conference, they usually have a conference in a very nice city with everything, but you hope. If you are presenting, you hope the weather is really, really bad and it's really messy because otherwise nobody will show up, right? So you want to have the conference in the best location possible with the worst weather so nobody can go out but stay inside. Um, so I guess, um, anyway, so continuing with the, with the sensors, right? Um, we're not going into too much detail because you know getting into detail would would bog us down. And I encourage you to look into these papers to see what they are specifically doing. Right. So I'm going to try to cover two papers today, um, and they both solve important problems. And there's been a lot of work beyond, going beyond this stuff. And both of them were judged to be one of them got the best paper award, other one was nominated for the best paper award. So they they were considered to be really good. Right. Um, so if you follow the sensor networking research, they, they, they really, really stress about making it really small. If you talk to the real sensor networking folks, they talk about these really small sensors, which are few pennies kind of stuff, and they don't really do much. They try to do stuff with them. But when you're talking about video sensors and stuff, you're not, you cannot stay with the cost argument too much. You have to have something interesting to work with, because A, you, you know, if you want good quality video, you have to have the optics. You have to have it kind of sticking out so you can see what's going on, and you have to have some kind of processing because you know these things are big and everything, right? So that that means that we can do a lot of nice stuff. So you know the, that's one of the different stuff. But um, there's there's a lot of this work, right? So these so the, the one of the papers we looked at, you know, the the in the last um, last last uh, lecture. The, the Cascades project, right? So they were worried about if you have all these sensors, if you have all these video sensors across the Oregon coast and you're trying to take pictures, what do you do with the data, right? You can't possibly send everything to a central site because then you're sending really large of, uh, amounts of data. So you would like to keep them in, in the network itself. So you want to do some kind of a processing in the network, but you can't really do all that much. So you want to sign up, kind of aggregate something across the system. So you want something like, you know, these few sensors saw somebody, and you want that to kind of go up, and you sort of send a query back saying, okay, you, you know, you, you, all of you saw some somebody. I want you to run this more complicated algorithm which tries to figure out what exactly happened, you know, who it was, and all those things. So you want this sort of information. You want to downscale it to a point where you can do queries with it, and then you can make more interesting, you know, iterative process like that, and that tends to be pretty hard, and so they're worried about how, how to do this, this kind of a, a artifact, right? So, and, you know, so that's one line of research. The other line of two research here is the, the first one is it's talking about, so we, we talked about having, you know, you need really high fidelity sensors to capture all the stuff. So you want really high definition camera, which can do a lot of processing and stuff. And they tend to be pretty energy uh, inefficient because, you know, by, by nature they are bigger and all those things. So can you build a sort of a multi-tier of these things where they trip each other to perform a global task, right? So for example, in a trivial case, in this room, if you want to detect who all is sitting in this classroom, right? You know, for some reason, already wants to figure out who is in the classroom and what they were doing, right? So maybe they can install some few video cameras here, which is constantly watching everything. So you know, there's one camera watching each seat and so on and so forth, right? But for the most part, but, you know, especially after after hours and after six o'clock or something, there's nobody here, right? So can we kind of have multiple levels where one level is if there's some light in this room, start doing something, right? Or maybe have a sensor on the door. When you open the door, then it trips something. Then it reacts acts other one, right? So the first one could be you know if the door opened. The second one can be if there's light in the room, right? So it may be the case that the janitor came in and just left, right? So you may not want to wake up the higher higher level uh, stuff. You can leave the lower level uh, stuff to do the processing. So with the multi-tier one, your the the nice part is then you can actually have best of both worlds, right? You can have this more powerful ones, 
but not spend energy to keep them running and only worry about the smaller ones, right? But the challenge here then becomes, how do these, the smaller ones make decisions which can be correlated with something on the, on the higher end, right? So you don't want to say, like for example in this room, every time there is light, you should start processing, right? Which may mean that if somebody left the light on, you don't want to do this stuff. So it has to recognize that not all light is good, but light with certain thing is good, right? So how do you kind of add enough knowledge to the stuff where it knows something is going on, but not exactly enough? So, because otherwise you'll trigger the higher level very, very often and things will, will, will fall apart, right? So that's, that's that line of work in the, in the first one. How do you do this multi-tier kind of stuff? The second one, uh, there's, there's a lot more work be going beyond this stuff. And you, you may, you may, you're seeing some of the aspects of this in YouTube and cameras and stuff, right? Which is, if you want to query what's in, in a particular video, you want annotations, right? So if I, if I take a picture, if I take a video of here, I want to know who's on the video because otherwise it's not that useful because you know, I, I can either go in manually and say who was sitting here, what the name was and all those things, but otherwise it's a bunch of people you tend to get forget, you know, you tend to go, you can't search, you can't do all the stuff. So you can collect all these videos without any sort of annotation, without sort of knowing what is in the system. It's, you know, the utility is not that much, right? So if you want to annotate, the simplest thing is for you to go in and, and add, add the annotation, which is one of the things that you see in YouTube, right? I can go in using annotation editor and you know, say who's in there and what they were saying and all those things. And it tends to be pretty uh, uh, labor intensive. Most people don't do that because it's, you know, it's kind of labor intensive and kind of boring, right? So for example, if I have a camera here, right? If I have a camera here for the next 15 minutes and you're not moving, it's sort of easy to annotate. I can say you are here and, and it's all done. But if you, if you have things moving around, I have to sort of go and say, I'm, I'm seeing you, I'm seeing this stuff kind of thing, right? So the, the goal here would be to sort of automatically annotate it, right? And there's a lot of uses for it. Uh, one is, I think one of the, the important use for that is in, in uh, tourist videos, right? If you have any kind of tourist videos and you say, if, say you go to Europe for, for a week, come back, and unless you annotate it right away, right? If you look at it like a few years back afterwards, you barely remember stuff. You know, you remember the Eiffel Tower or some, some well-known uh, constructs. But the other ones kind of, you kind of forget because they all look like buildings after a while. So you want some kind of annotation sort of going through right, 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 while, right while you're doing this stuff. And it, it turns out the problem is very, very hard. Even if you want to do pattern recognition or uh, computer algorithms to do that, right? Because what happens is if I'm carrying a camera and so, in, in the image processing sense, what I can do is I can have a model of these different buildings. Right? So I can have some sort of model for Eiffel Tower. So I can look in each of the frame and all the pixels to see if it sees something which looks like a Eiffel Tower. That, that's basically the, the, the crux of the algorithms that you want to do, which is you create a model for some uh, event, for, for, for a building or whatever. And then when you have video for each frame, for each pixel or group of pixel, you try to figure out what that object is and then try to match it with what, what you have in your database. Right? That, that's, that's the crux of what you do. But since you are free from in, in terms of what you're doing, right? so how many of you have background in image processing, image recognition sort of stuff? Do you work in image? You work, right? So in, in my, my impression is if you're working in image processing, it's a lot easier if you keep all these parameters sort of the same, right? It's a lot harder if you have freeform, right? So if you, freeform meaning like, I don't constrain what you do with the Eiffel Tower, right? So, so if you suppose you take a picture of the Eiffel Tower standing right beneath it and looking up, right? It looks a lot different than what it looks from somewhere else, right? But so to, to do that kind of a processing becomes very hard because you're, you're having all kind of stuff. So you have to kind of account for what kind of a camera you had, what kind of lens you had, what are sighting conditions on those days and all those things, and it, it you know, you can, you can get, get by in, on good conditions certain things, but in harder conditions it becomes harder, right? And you see some of these things being incorporated into, I think, the, the Apple iMovie or, or YouTube and all those things. If YouTube can do this automatically and figure out, I, th I think YouTube is trying to figure out if there's a human being, you know, fa do some face to say, it doesn't know who you are, but at least knows there's a, there's a face and can, it can kind of let you annotate it. Right? So one line of research is trying to figure out how to uh, in, in, in give a random video, go through the stuff, and then figure out what you saw. Right? And those things tend to be really, really hard, but they would be really, really awesome if you can do that. Right? 
Um, one of the applications you might have seen is, like, if you look at the latest photo sites like Flickr and all, right? They get integrated with some of the maps. So if you search for Notre Dame, you see all the videos which are taken in Notre Dame, which we, you see all the pictures taken in that area kind of stuff, right? So those things, you, right now you have to manually go and enter these things so you can do this stuff. You are trying to do automated, right? The third approach is, we know that automated, automatic recognition is hard, right? So rather than doing automatic detection, I leave some sort of marker on these things, right? So for so you know if it's if it's just a tree, I don't have a marker. But for say Eiffel Tower, I leave a marker. And the idea here is so when I take a picture, right, there is a sensor kind of thing going on. So we have the, the camera has to figure out where it's looking. So if you figure out where the camera is looking, right, and if you figure out what the camera's angle is, right? And if you figure out all the things in this room based on sensors, so I put a sensor on each of you, right? So I know from, the system knows where you are, because let's say you're carrying something which shows your name, right? like an ID tag or something. And there are systems, things in this room which know where things are. So I know where people are, but what I don't know is what I'm taking, right? So now I have to put something on my camera. So the camera sort of, knows where it's looking. So if you have a camera and the camera, if you can figure out if the camera is like pointing which way, so it has to know where you are, where the camera is, it has to know where it's pointing, it has to know what angle it's recording, right? It, that depends on your lens setting and stuff. So if I know all the stuff, then I can kind of know that I know you are here. So if I have a camera which is pointing this way and the angle of view is right here, then nothing has to be annotated. But if I sort of change the camera here, then it knows that it's, it has a camera which is here. So using your geometry, you know, um, given your particular lens uh, uh, characteristics, which, how far it's seeing. So based on that, I can say, uh, you know, at this point, my camera can see these three people. And it doesn't know who you are, but it knows that, so it, it can compute on this frame, right, in this particular image, what would have corresponded to each one of each one of this stuff, right? Then, then I can then I can build this model. That's what they're trying to do, right? So I, I know what these different markers are based on something based on the sensors, but now I'm trying to figure out. So if it, if this thing worked, it's really good because then then I can I can take a camera, I can do like this, I can move the camera really fast, right? If it's all if it's all synchronized, then all I need to know is where the camera was at that exact time. The time is a really crucial part here. So if I know precisely at this particular frame, I'm pointing at him, and I know that you should be in the center, then I can kind of annotate you with that, with that picture frame, and voila, things work, right? And that's what they're, they're trying to do. So they're using sensors, so they, each object knows where they are. Now your goal is trying to figure out where the camera is and, and point these things, right? And there's there a lot of use for that. There's other projects which, which expand on this model, um, especially for the uh, things like the Google Street kind of thing, right? I don't know how exactly Google Street works, right? But you, you might have seen the Google Street, right? Uh, so essentially, they, they drive around, right? So the, they drive around, and the camera has a 360 view of, of, of what, what it's seeing, right? And hopefully, it's tagging where it is. It's tagging exactly where, where it is, right? So now the problem is, how do you... You link back from what you what the picture to where the thing was, right? So the idea here is, let's say the truck moved like this, right? And they were taking pictures as they move along, right? So they have no control over how fast this the truck truck which is taking the picture moved, right? So it's taking pictures over uh, along these different roads, right? And it has to know where exactly it was precisely. So it has to know that at this point it was at time t1, at this point it was at time t2, right? Not you know, in, in, the, in the global map, so they can correlate it to that one. And then when they take the pictures, they have to know that this picture was taken at time t1. So these have to be synchronized extremely accurately. So once you know that, you know that this picture was taken at time t1, you know that at time t1 you're in this particular location, then they can kind of correlate it in the map. So Whenever you come to this location, it, it figures out where you are, right? The synchronization is extremely important because if the timing was slightly off, it'll think that, it may think that this particular frame is what happened when you were here, and things are all off and people don't really like it, right? If you look at the Google street map, it's not precise to, you know, um, 
to the to the pixel kind of stuff, but it's it's generally fairly accurate enough that you can sort of use uh, use this thing, right? So it turns out the my they, the, I, the Google Street actually came to the, our area, right? I saw it like a couple of days back that uh, they apparently came in front of my house and took pictures, right? So from from the so the you know they have a sign of for sale from from a neighbor, which was two summers back. So it apparently took them two summers to process it and then put them on the web so you can be, figure out uh, where we are, right? Um, and so so that's one thing. So it, it takes them apparently a long time because it 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 at least took like a year and a half or two to put them on the web. The other thing is. This thing is far more accurate than whatever map they do, right? So for some reason, the street that we live in is not known to Google. It used to be known, but now it forgot, right? But the um, the actual when they actually drove through it, those are correctly marked, right? Even though Google itself does not know where we live, right? So the the location is based probably on the GPS coordinates, not on the map that they know, right? So according to the map, this particular street doesn't exist, but they did drive through it, and then you can still drive through it using Google Street to see that there are houses and you know people and all those things, but these things, right? So that's the that's a slightly different approach to this you know to, to this problem, and there are other other uh, things that people are trying to do. You know, if you can in a city, if you can know where the buildings are. So if you instead of marking these sensors, right, if you can kind of input into the system where the different param where the different objects are, then you can use them relatively to figure out where thing where 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 you're pointing, right? So I don't have a sensor on something, but I kind of know where the buildings are and how they should look, and then using that to figure out what these things are. There are a lot of implications for travel, for implications for, for Google Street Map kind of stuff. So, so this is the, the, the class of uh, applications where you're trying to figure out, you're trying to annotate the world uh, without, with, with as little or as, as much things as possible. So those are the two, two papers that I think are pretty interesting, and they show what, what is possible with these things. And again, these two are not really concerned about how small or how big the different sensors are. They assume that each sensor, you need uh, you need a certain amount of capabilities to, to get the job done. Um, but what, what is the interesting stuff, right? I think that the second thing, if you can make some sort of a headway, there's humongous potential for consumer camera kind of stuff, right? Um, so if I can take a picture and the camera kind of says, okay, do you want me to annotate it as Eiffel Tower or something, right? Um, especially a lot of the camera, cameras these days come with GPS, right? So they know where you are. So if they can kind of do some processing to annotate these things, then um, that, that's a competitive advantage for the, for the person who's in the camera. So that's, that's a good thing, right? So those are the, the two systems. So the first system, like I pointed out, um, it, the, one of the biggest challenges with all these things is what kind of a sensors you have to build, right? And especially for tracking and all those things, the, the, the most highest resolution that you, you can get is, the, is, is what you really want. But they also tend to be more expensive, they tend to be bulky, they tend to be all that. So you don't, so you're, you're, you're either left with having, making a compromise and deploying something which may give you good resolution for what you're trying to do, but it may not go beyond what you want. So, in the case of the uh, one of the you know the, the L L London sensor kind of thing, right, and uh, the video cameras, right, they deploy so many media cameras. If they were to upgrade everything to high definition, then the amount of data that they have to get would be beyond what they can process, right. So, they have to kind of settle with VGA level quality, which is not good because if you think about it, VGA level quality is good if you if you have somebody framed like this, but if you're looking at a crowd and you using VGA, VGA quality, each person gets maybe one or two pixel. From that you can say well, you can recognize that there is a human being, right? Which is usually not that useful because if you look at say Piccadilly Square and you see a bunch of people, um, I don't have to look at the video to know that there's a bunch of people standing there, right? So the so the other approach is to have these multiple sensors. You can have lots of the lower, cheaper sensors, and they kind of trigger higher quality sensors. The higher quality sensors now don't have to be on all the time. They don't have to, you don't need as many of them, but they only, you know, if you do it right, they only get triggered when, when things are really uh, need, need to be uh, addressed and, and you go with that, right? So overall, your hope is this multi-tier stuff is 
more cost effective because you can you can have fewer of the expensive stuff and more of the the uh, uh, other stuff more coverage because now you can have a lot more of the 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 the, the tripping cheaper ones um, and and the fewer of the the expensive ones right so one of the one of the cases that i don't think they looked at it is if you have a in in this room right you can have a camera which is pan tilt and zoom you know, the, the ptc but essentially which means that the camera can move anywhere and then zoom in right so you can have sort of one camera watching the whole class if if you have a sensor which figures out where you are so if a sensor says there's a bunch there's for somebody walking in then the camera can move in and track that person right so you can you can devote your resources to buy this one camera uh, they tend to be more expensive, but it only gets triggered when, when the other things notice, so you, you can kind of get a uh, better handle of the things, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, the applications for those are, are you know, whatever you can imagine, right? Uh, environment monitoring to track uh, exotic animals, that, that's a project out of, um, I forget where in Africa, they, I believe Kenya, right? So they were trying to trying to monitor zebras and stuff. So the, the goal here is to uh, monitor um, monitor animals in the wild, and they don't tend to come to the place all the time. So you know, if you have these things, you can trigger them to only take uh, high high resolution pictures when they need to, and other times nothing happens, right? And the key here is the trigger has to be good because that's that's the challenge here, right? The trigger is if it's trigger happy, if it notices any sense of movement, right? Um, then you're, you're probably going to take video which has no no meaning. So you want to say if I if you see an elephant, trigger this, right? Not if you see a, a mouse moving or something. You know, don't bother with that, right? Um, rescue, search and rescue missions. The, the the idea here is if you put all these cameras uh, all over the system, uh, you can continuously monitor them and until uh, especially like you know like the earthquake kind of stuff, right? If, if there's no movement, don't bother. But if, if you see a slightest movement, there may be something, then you trigger resources towards them. Um, baby monitor, which is a, um, which a lot of faculty tend to like because I guess they, they tend to have babies and they do research, right? Um, so the, the, the key is to be able to map the task to the lowest level that you can. The, the key is to move the, the, the intelligence to the, um, the lower level stuff. Um, and, and and you, you want to exploit the redundancy in coverage. So you, you may have multiple cameras, multiple sensors. So if the lower level can give me accurate information, that saves the upper level stuff. The lower level stuff says there is some human being in this room, then you have to figure out where people are. The lower level stuff can say the person is sitting here, then the upper level can reduce what, what the task it's, uh, it has to do. Um, and, and there is a number of reasons why you want to do this stuff. So even in the case of a video camera, um, I don't know if you can see this stuff, but essentially they, they were looking at the energy consumption for different kinds of cameras. And, and next class I'll show you the one of the, the virtual car cameras. There are a lot of small cameras which are not as accurate, but they are small and they're inexpensive, right? Uh, there's the CMU camera. Um, it's you know, they, they, they report the amount of energy it, it, it took and, and uh, uh, those figures, right? So these cameras tend not to be very high quality, right? In terms of the resolution, they tend not to have multiple frames per second as good as the regular high resolution cameras, but they're good enough to make, uh, uh, do some analysis, right? There's a lot of interesting work coming going on in, in this kind of a system. There, there's work from uh, Johns Hopkins. One of the things they were trying to do was build sensors where they do the detection right next to the pixel that detects the light. Right? So you build this one chip, and it's sort of designed to detect only one thing in life. Right? So it's not, it's not general purpose at all. So you have the pixel next to the, the CPU element. So sort of the way you can think of this is, I can build one sensor which can detect you and nothing else. Right? You can detect whether it's you or, or somebody else. Right? The idea here is, build, so they're cheap to build. So you build lots of those, and have many of those spread around the room to kind of Recognize different people, right? Um, so the the other yeah. So, so these kind of cameras are not really designed for higher level stuff. They can do some sort of detection. They're not accurate enough to to make a definitive answer of who, what you're looking at, but they're good enough to trigger the higher level stuff. 
and they're much more energy efficient. So that means that they can continuously monitor this room. Right? So nothing really, uh, nothing really goes beyond that. So this is this is still beyond using motion detectors because motion detectors would detect any motion. So these things can detect that there is there is some human being kind of stuff. So that that's the that's the goal. So those are different kinds of the hardware, right? So if you, so MOT is one form of a sensor. If you have MOT connected to a CMU cam, which is one of the, the more, the cheaper cameras talking about, right? So that tells you how much energy it takes to do certain processing. I mean, sorry, uh, to, um, so it, it takes 13.4 joules for, for the MOT, 13.153.8 joules for the camera, right? So, and it tells you how much, what's the duty cycle for particular those things, right? Um, and the, the Cyclops is another set, another model of camera uh, connected to the moat. Um, you know, it takes it takes less energy, but it takes a lot longer to to get anything out. Um, and the and the depending on the so, and if you look over here, it tells you the different kinds of modes and and the amount of energy, right? So there's the mica mode, which takes 84 milliwatt. And, and certain amount of memory and stuff, right? I don't know if you can see it from there. And there's a Stargate, which is, you know, it takes um, 170 to 400 milliwatt, and it has more memory, it can do a little bit more processing. Right? So you're trying to figure out what type of a computing platform, what camera you want, and given your, your choice of this mode, it tells you how much energy you need, but it also the holds you to that kind of processing, right? So if you take a, um, Mica mode, it probably doesn't have enough resources to compute um, much more than whether there's light or dark kind of stuff, right? So, so it, it's not very important what specifically these modes are. Um, the, the key to remember is you typically have, if it's extremely low energy, it's also extremely low uh, CPU uh, power, right? Um, so the, the slower, the, the lower energy it takes, the less computing power it has. The, the same for the, for the camera too, right? If it takes more energy, it's likely to have more capabilities which, which take more energy. So at the first level, you're trying to find things which are as energy efficient as possible, which means that you may have to choose the lowest amount of CPU, the lowest amount of uh, the camera and stuff. The goal here is tier one, has to be on all the time, right? Because tier one is sort of the gateway, right? So tier one has to wake up tier two and, and so on and so forth. So this system depends on the tier one being vigilant at all the time, right? So if tier one does not trigger, then the other, 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 uh, other, other levels will trigger, right? So I need to have enough CPU, I need to have enough, enough camera capabilities to know that something is happening, but not more than that, right? But at least that much. So, so that defines what what I have to pick. Right? So, so tier gate tier two, uh, they use a star gate, which is more of a X scale kind of processor. Now it has more energy. So this this would be similar to the um, the um, the one from uh, last week, Panoptes, right? That's the sensor that they built. So that's X scale kind of processor. This is a little bit more uh, more compute um, more compute in power, which means that it can uh, support better cameras, right? So I think I think in the in the case of Panoptes they could actually come up with I think I believe six or some frames per second, right? So you have the tier one and then the tier two. So the tier one detected something was going on. It wakes up the tier two. Tier two now consumes more energy, but it can it can do more analysis, right? And before it can do that, it has to know it has to pass some information up the level so it you, so it can be. Uh, um, Smarter, right? So, so instead of saying I found something, it, it's good if it said I found something in this direction, right? So the next level can take from where it left, right? So, uh, of course, in the, in the paper um, they, they they only had two tiers, and, and, and in, in the two tiers um, they did analysis to see how much energy you waste in 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 terms of these systems, and the you know the two tier system was. Um, was you know was useful and that's that's one of the reasons why um, you you look at these things. Um, so you know, and it, it's obvious why you would save the power because you know the the tier one is much less energy consuming, so it can be on all the time, right? Um, 
And, but, but again, the, the, the key problem is not to have multiple tiers. The key, the key challenge is to make sure that the, the first tier can do enough stuff to wake up the second tier in the nice sense. Right? And that, that's, that, that's sort of where they, where they left off in that research. And essentially what happens is at this point, the recognition moves to the image processing community. Right? So if, 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 if I take your image processing community, so this is a different way of presenting the problem. Right? So now you have developed algorithms which are not designed to do the best job possible uh, to recognize somebody. Right? It's, doing, it's designed to figure out recognize something based on the resources that are given to it, not based on what, so you're bounded by resources, right? So I'm going to say artificially that you have to live with this, this, little, this little bit of CPU, little bit of camera, see what you can do, right? I want your recognition to be good. I'm not really worried about how, how good you can do, but you know, this algorithm has to do good for the artificial stuff I give you, artificial CPU, artificial, um, the, the camera limitation, but I would like for you to do as good a job in recognizing what is going on. I would like for you to do a really excellent job of telling something to the higher level that can really help them, right? So whatever knowledge you gained, if it can be translated into directly into the next more complicated system, then it's good, right? If, if, if you can say, I, I suspect something is going on here, second, second level doesn't have to search all the way through, it can it kind of, know how to collate it, right? So the first level has to say something which means something for the second level, rather than saying, I think I found something, look at the whole scene, right? And those sort of algorithms are not really designed by the, the image processing community, and, and, and the, the paper was calling for them to develop those algorithms because the image processing community would actually look at algorithms which can stand alone tell you what's going on. And here, you're not trying to do that. You, you're trying to come up with something which, which does sort of decent job, uh, but it has to present it in a form where something else can take over, right? And that, that's the that's 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 the key with, with all these things, right? Does that make sense? And uh, so I wish they, they they could have taken this far. And, and like most of the things in in research, one of the things that if you if you undergrad, if you go into <coughs> more research. Uh, either in school or, 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 or in labs or, or what have you, or if you're a grad student, right? Um, when you have two different fields, uh, two or three different fields kind of colliding at, 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 at one point, right? So the, the video sensor community would like certain things from the image processing community, but unless image processing community thinks of this as something useful for publications in their own conferences, they have no motivation to work on this sort of research, right? And that's where a lot of these things kind of stumble, you know, stumble, right? And that's one of the reasons why I sort of like the TV project, because the TV project, you remember the one from Urbana Champagne, right? The, the dancer stuff, right? The dancer stuff is really useful for the computer scientists, right? They can they can write pop papers about it, they can talk about the synchronization of all, all these things, talk about all the all the cool stuff, right? I am not convinced what it means to the dancers themselves, right? Because if you're a dancer, um, and I don't know how dancers, grads and graduate students publish, right? I don't know. I don't know how they publish, right? So whatever they publish, right? Um, I suspect that it's it's really cool to say I come up with this new dance scheme that no one else in the world knows, right? So I suspect that's sort of how you present, right? Not that I did the dance that the basic level people would do because that's what this computer thing can support, right? I'm sure if that person was to like swirl around it like super fast and everything, the system will break down, right? So you know she's kind of kind of going like like this, right? I'm sure you cannot publish a paper which says that I showed how to dance like very slow like this, right? So that's the challenge, right? So how do you how do you collaborate when the other other community other person sees no value in it because they're like that's a that's the dance you teach, not one on one, but you know. Zero, zero, 001 or some level, right? And the same here, right? You're not coming with, so you're saying, I don't care about the best algorithm. I want, I want to give you this really, really low power camera, really, really low power system. I want you to develop an algorithm which will recognize something, right? And, and that, 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 that's an eternal problem. Um, and it's unfortunate, but um, you have, I mean, graduate students have to graduate, right? So you're not doing this on the best of your, um, to, to help somebody else, and that's the, and that's that's the problem here. So, 
you recognize that this is a problem, uh, the solutions are very hard to achieve because there's no motivation for the, the image processing community to do this sort of a thing. Right? So anyway, so th this is the, the other paper, the sensor annotated video annotation. Right? Um, so they had to build a lot of hardware because you have to figure out now what you're doing. Right? You have to figure out where things are and they had to build these kind of, kind of sensors. But the idea here is I need to know precisely where my camera is, right? So I need to know precisely where my camera is in 3D space in this room, right? Because it, it depends on what it's seeing, right? If I know only the 2D space, the camera might be on the floor, in which case all it sees is this bunch of chairs, right? So it has to know that it's up here because it has to know then what it's looking, right? So I have to know where the camera is in 3D space and I have to know where it's oriented, right? Because if the camera was like pointing at the ceiling, nothing. So I need to know where the camera is oriented. I also have to know what the, the camera zoom factor and all those things, because if you change those, things change drastically, right? So you need a lot of, so you need some sort of sensors to figure out where I am. And they use two different systems. They use the indoor, indoor uh, sensing system and outdoor GPS system. And you need to figure out you need to talk to the camera to figure out where it's looking, right? And though it's possible to do, and this is sort of the thing that, that uh, I think I mentioned at the beginning of the class of how the, the football games are, are um, the annotation for the thing, right? The, the feel, the lines, right? The way it's annotated, you know, because they know that the camera talks to the software. So the camera tells the software how much it's zoomed out, so it exactly knows uh, what it's seeing, so it can actually draw the line. So if you look at the lines on the football stadium, right? Even if they move the camera, it, you still see the line. The line doesn't move with you, right? The line looks like it's on the scene because the camera is telling the software, I'm moving now from here to here with a certain zoom factor, so, that, so it knows where the, uh, where the boxes are, right? You remember the thing, right? So if you had the football stadium was here and a camera was pointing at, at, at towards this direction, right? So the software has to know that it's pointing at this direction. So it, it virtually draws this line, right? Now if you move the camera this way, right? The camera has to keep telling the software, now I'm moving, right? So now maybe it's pointing this way. So the, the correct frames are marked in, in, the, in, in the good fashion so that when you watch it on the TV, you don't notice these things are happening. You know, when they, when they do a, a pan of the scene, it still looks like the lines were drawn on the, on the field, but they can do that because the camera has talked to the software, right? So they, they would have to figure out where exactly you are using GPS or indoor system. They use a uh, system called Cricket from MIT. So that figures out where you are, and they have to figure out what the zoom parameters and stuff. In the prototype, they didn't look at the zoom parameters because it tends to make the math even more uh, harder. So they just use a fixed zoom, which means that they know precisely how they're looking at. And so these are the, the things. So they had to build some of these sensors themselves um, in this sensor networking group. So they, they like to build, build this sort of a things. And yeah, there, there are a lot of, lot of problems, right? So GPS is accurate uh, within 10 meters, right? Which is not exactly good for what you would like to do. Uh, 10 meters, you know, um, to, to give you a sense, it can basically say that I'm, I'm sort of in this part of De Bartolo, right? Um, actually, maybe, you know, so, yeah, so within, within pretty far, right? That's really not good for using in this kind of systems because um, if you say I could be anywhere, even if you ignore within this room, right? If it says that I could be anywhere from there to there, right? I have no idea what you're pointing at because it could be pointing at anything because the, the range is too high. In those systems that they use could be within a few centimeters, which is sort of good enough because it basically can say I'm either I'm here within sort of the sort of a range, right? And all these systems with that kind of accuracy, what it manifests is if I have wide angle, I'm sort of okay, right? Which means that if I'm if it, if I don't know, if you don't know whether I'm here or here, right? If I'm doing a wide angle, meaning I'm, I can see the whole thing, then the difference in where you are, so if you look at a, let's say you have a, you take a picture here, right? And if I were to take the picture over from this corner, right? Let's say I expect somebody to show up here. If I move within a few centimeters, 
you expect, let's say, the, the person to be here, right? The, the difference between those two locations to be that little, right? So you kind of tolerate that because then you can say, I don't really know where you are, but I sort of know in this area, right? If it is a meter or something, what will happen is one scheme will say um, you are here, the other scheme will, will, other camera picture will see you are so far, and it's now good, right? Because annotation will say, if, if you thought I was here, annotation will say I should be here. If you thought I was here, you say the annotation should be here. The user could be anywhere in the middle and things are off. So the, the, the system uh, thing. So the, you know, they give uh, reasons of why you want to do this stuff. And um, there, there are a lot of, I mean, so when they did this, there's not much of the systems going on. But if you if you look now, uh, more and more, you know, you have all this Flickr and stuff. People don't want Flickr pictures to just be a picture, but they want some sort of annotation to figure out what's what's going on. So you, you do all this. You know, you uh, you map them to a mapping service. So uh, if I'm going to a new city, I can look at all the pictures of uh, interesting uh, place with all the other other people. Um, so I can I can search for pictures of. You, you probably won't want to do Eiffel Tower because there's probably lots of pictures, but other stuff, right? So you may not want to do the dome, but dome from the back or something, and you hopefully won't have too many pictures and you, you want to do these things. Um, and this is back in the days, right? So before the, you could do these sort of annotation. So um, right now you don't know what you're looking at and what you're seeing. You would, if you have some annotations, maybe this is useful um, in terms, you know. So simple things like GPS and stuff to say where you were, but more complicated stuff to see what exactly you are watching, right? Yeah, and, and you, you know, more examples of what, what sort of things you would want. So if, I, if I'm looking for somebody, I want to know uh, the person, not the, I mean, I want to know that the, in some picture somebody was here. And again, we, can, we are beginning to see a lot of this stuff because a lot of these applications let you add these things on the fly, right? Um, Facebook does that, you know, if you use Facebook, you can, you can kind of annotate it and say, this is where the person is, and then you can use annotation. And those annotations, as you can imagine, it's, it tends to be kind of sort of um, boring after a while. So if you took a, um, if I took like 10 pictures of this room, right? You may annotate it once, but not all the pictures saying all the things because you, you tend to get bored. Um, so essentially, what they're trying to do is, you know, you 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 have the video stream, then you sort of have a sensor stream which knows where things are, and you sort of try to correlate them so that you have an annotated stream which can kind of point at where things are, right? And for this to happen, sensor stream, whatever it's saying, has to be correlated pretty accurately. Um, so, um, so, actually, so example, so if the sensor says that at time t3, there is an object here, there's another object here, there's an object here. So if you have a camera, you have to have a model of what the camera is pointing to, right? And you have to use that to figure out what might be in the scene, right? So you know that the camera was taking pictures, and for each frame, you have to figure out at, at when the frame was taken, where you were pointing at. Then you can do the processing to figure out what would be there. So in this particular case, if a camera is pointing this way, I know nothing, nothing is uh, in, the, in the picture. So there's no annotation, right? If this camera was changed into a wide angle where the, where the cone sort of becomes like this, then I know that at this instant, I was watching here. So, I, so what, I, what I'm doing is, since I know where I am, I project this stuff, right? I, I, I draw the cone. So I know that the picture I'm taking would be like this, right? So in that picture, this, you know, this far away, whatever object is, would be this particular object, right? So, I, so if, I, if, I do, if I do wide angle like this, right? And what I know is, if I'm taking a video at this point with this wide, wide, wide angle, right? So the frame that I capture, right, would have, let's say this is x, right? Whatever, so I know that somewhere over here 
this particular object should be visible. Right? Because my math would say that I'm, I'm looking this way, which means that anything at this distance would be captured in my frame. So since I know there is object here, then in my annotation, I would, I would, so I can, I can go, I can go in the frame. I don't have to look at the frame. I can say, if my calculations are right, at this point, whatever it is, whatever you see on the image at this point would have been this object, right? So I'm not sure how much of image processing background you would have. Um, what would be the problem of this with respect to occlusion, right? Occlusion is a phenomena where the things are blocking something in the back, right? So for example, if, there's another, if there was something here, right? Your math would be off unless I knew where the objects were, right? Because I, I didn't, if I didn't know this object, then your math basically says that if you're, if you're pointing this way, you ought to be able to see this, right? So you need to have a map of these things, right? So let, let's say there's a wall here, right? Right? Then I could be looking this way. I can have the camera here looking at this wall, right? If the wall was not here, I would be able to see whatever is on the other side. So if you, if you had a tag, and if you're on the other side of the wall, if I have a camera here pointing, system knows that there is uh, somebody on the other side. So it can take a, you can say you were there, but there's a wall, right? So I don't, I don't see it, right? So wall is trivial because walls don't tend to move all that much. Whereas it could be other events. So it could be a car or something. So if you're looking at real life, there could be other stuff which, which are uploading, right? In their approach, in general, uh, in general, these kind of approaches, you can't, you can't know that, right? Because all you know that you, the only thing you know in this world is all those yellow dots. You don't, if you don't know something, if you don't know there is a thing here blocking this thing, you have no way of knowing that things are being occluded. In many cases, the argument is you are okay, right? The wall case is sort of uh, bad. But if I were to take a camera here, and if I'm like pointing at somebody, right? If I, if I take a picture of you, and you happen to be right behind the person in the front, that I can't really see on the camera. But if the annotation says that you are two persons, because essentially you are you and the other person. In many senses, cases is okay, right? Even if you can't see the person, if the annotations, the argument is most of the time is okay. If you take a picture, and somebody is in the back, they're too short, they shouldn't have been in the back, they don't show up on the picture, but the annotation says you were there because you know that's the thing. You're okay, right? Your mileage may vary because you know I don't know how, how good it is. It's a very hard problem because to solve that you need to know everything about the world, and everything about the world means, in their sense, putting a lot more sensors on everything in the world, uh, which may or may not be um, possible. One of the ways that they are moving with this project is to have RFID tags, right? So uh, RFID tags, if you like stores like. Um, Walmart and all use RFID tags to figure out where the boxes are. You know, all the items you buy, you have the cheap tags connected to those stuff. So if you have a lot of these RFID tags, um, they are cheap, so I can stick them on everything, right? So one of the one of the researchers was you know putting them on coffee mugs and everything. So when, once you have those, you can sort of figure out all these things. But then you add other problems because you now your world looks too noisy, right? So if I put a tag on every little thing in this room, uh, then this whole bunch of stuff, the computations become harder and stuff. So at some point, you, you come up with something. But anyway, that's the thing. So um, then you can do extrapolations. Right? If you know the camera is moving a certain way, then I can kind of figure out where you would be, depending on where the, where the camera is moving. Right? And again, it depends on you moving in a good pattern. So I need to figure out what is a typical pattern. Right? So you can make assumptions that human beings tend to walk slowly in a straight path. Right? Human beings don't sort of move like a superhero kind of thing. But if if that's if you if that is the case, then it becomes harder, right? Um, so again, again, you know, so the um, so you figure out what you're watching, what the object is, and you figure out where there should be, and then you annotate that object. Even though you have no idea what you're, you're not doing any image processing. You're only doing correlation. The the key here is that the time uh, correlation has to be precise because. Um, because otherwise, if the camera moved or the object moved, you will be marking the wrong stuff. Um, and there are a lot, lot of problems with, with maintaining time across the whole thing, right? So their, uh, their approach is approximate. 
because you can't do precisely because uh, these are different entities. So if, if you have a sensor which is measuring this stuff, it's giving a time, and a camera which is measuring its time, then keeping them extremely uh, synchronized is very hard. So they're based on more of a causality-based system, which means that when I heard it, in the usual cases, the time delay is small enough that it's sort of okay, right? It depends on what you're trying to look at. If, you, if you're a human being, you tend to be within a certain pixel, you're okay. Um, it may not work if it's something really small. If I'm looking at like your pen or something, the uh, offset, offset may be pretty high. Um, so this is their sort of their, their platform. So the, the cameras, so they had a laptop, added the camera, added the location system to figure out where you are. Um, I'm sort of out of time. So essentially, um, they did some evaluation and it sort of worked, right? And, and, and all the systems you expect they would have worked because if they didn't, it wouldn't have been published, right? Uh, and essentially, if, if things don't move, things work fine. And so they had like things in a pulley to figure out to predict motion. So they, they put some object on a, on, a, uh, on a cable, let it go in a straight line path. It can predict because it's sort of easy. Um, and the last one, they put some objects on a, on a, on a, on a um, on one of these flat things and then use remote control to move them around, then it becomes more random because it depends on how you're controlling the stuff. So the more random it becomes, the less accurate things are, but for the most part, they're okay under, under control circumstances. You don't get to zoom the camera, uh, you don't get to move it too violently, and you're, you're sort of okay. Right? Yeah, so this is sort of what you would like to do. So when you come in here, you should say, in these frames there's a human being, the other frames there's not. Um, so I'll see you guys after next, next Wednesday, right? <laughs>